And now it is my pleasure to be bringing on my good friend, Renetta Jenick. She is the founder and CEO of Foodum, uh, an incredible startup that is uh, changing the face of how we eat, changing the way we eat. How are you doing, Renetta? Good. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm uh, very excited to be here with you. Uh, I am glad you are here. <laughs> we want to know about your business and what the product is. But, you know, on the Mark Haney Show, we like to tell the entrepreneurial journey, too, because, well, in many cases, it's like there's ups and downs. And we want to know, like, what inspired you to start it? Uh, maybe we start there. What what inspired you to start Foodum and, and what is it? And then I'll dive deep into the, uh, you know, in the challenges and tough times. <laughs> the fun times. The fun times, times. Yeah. yeah. But it's easy. It's like boring. <laughs> uh, so uh, what inspired me to start? Uh, it, the basic thing that inspired me to start is to just get food. Healthy, delicious, tasty food that will just be at my home. Whatever ah. I want, right there. I wasn't able to do that in a graceful way. Okay. I looked for solutions for many, many years, including checking different options and, and companies. And eventually, I just decided to take one for the team and to just build it. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so you have built a company that uh, magically puts food in your house, and then somebody comes in and cooks it, and it's just prepared, ready to eat at your doorstep or inside your house. Yeah, so it's basically um, we're, what I'm doing, I'm democratizing the private chef type of services where we're connecting between private chefs and busy families to mm -hmm. cook meals in the customer's kitchen one to two times a week on a regular basis. So the goal is to help families reduce the stress in their life and get healthy food tailored to whatever they need. Oh, and nice. on the other hand, create a lot of job opportunities for people that are passionate about cooking, artists that uh, love to cook. It's an art. Ah, so matchmaking the consumer with the, uh, with the chef. So let's, let's talk about what... You were, what, what inspired this originally? You wanted that for yourself, and then you decided to turn it into a business. You saw, hey, uh, there, because we know that there's chefs. We know that uh, you can go to, go to the grocery store and buy some food, but nobody out there was solving this, this challenge, this, uh, this opportunity to make things more convenient. Yeah, you, you, may, you make it sound so easy and simple, but it, it was a process of many, many years of okay. coming up to that. It actually started when I was a... Uh, very young, the whole thing started. Um, my family immigrated from Ukraine to Israel, and um, a few years after we moved to Israel, uh, my my mom died, and my dad uh, and and me and my sister, I was twelve, were figuring out what what are we gonna do uh, because she was the anchor of our life. My dad did not speak Hebrew, did not write the language, so he took over the thing he felt good uh, with is cooking. And I helped with the language and taking care of stuff, or, you know, through, with the government from very early age, uh, with the government bills, anything that's related to like managing the household stepped into, you know, what my mom used to do. And then throughout my life, I grew up and developed my business skills, and I was very good at that. But I uh, never got into the kitchen because my dad <laughs> never let anyone oh, into his kitchen until today. Actually, that's, yeah, so because your dad did all, the, your mom did all the work until she passed away. Then your dad did all the work. You, uh, you were a bit, you became the business person of the family. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you worked started, at Intel, right, and yeah. in, in other high tech companies. Yes. Yeah, so I, uh, throughout my career, my career was in uh, different uh, tech companies. Uh, the, I worked for SanDisk and then at Intel. And throughout the years, I developed the business skills and the technology skills. I was a, a the business uh, operations director for, a, a, I was at SanDisk first and then at a, HGST, managing data center SSDs and client SSDs. And then at Intel, I, I managed product for solid state drives in data center. And then AI and machine learning technology director in the client computing group. So this sounds like a, uh, a switch in uh, in occupation to a certain extent, not only from being an employee to be an entrepreneur, but being a high tech person to now this is a technical type of product, but it's um, it's not like working at Intel or SanDisk. Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful for the experience I had in corporate America. I, I worked with amazing teams and I saw uh, how you can build businesses the right way and the wrong way. <laughs> so I learned from the mistakes that uh, I saw around me happen in corporate. I was actually thinking about this today, uh, you know, checking and looking, uh, you know, uh, visualizing our strategy and what's the right path to go. 
And uh, I saw how it works in, in industries of billions of dollars in semiconductors where everybody's using it on a few devices. And then what the interesting thing is that actually eating is more basic than semiconductors because everybody's doing it a few times a day. But you can live without semiconductors. You will die without food. Yes. So it's actually even... And that's one of the things that excite me about this. It's a huge market. It's a pain point, and we can be a painkiller to some pain points. There, there are many ways you know, to get food. There are many companies that d- do semiconductors. There is room for everyone, but it's exciting to build something that can spark into a huge opportunity that will solve a problem to millions of people or tens of millions yes. uh, around the world. Yeah, so you said it's, uh, so it's convenient. I get that it would be convenient. You get online, you, you order what you want. Well, maybe describe the process. I get online and... And what do I do? Do I um, do I get to pick out what I want to eat, or who do, who decides all that? Yeah. So um, the way it works is that you go on our platform, and there is a menu, a big menu that we add items to it all the time, and it's mostly added by professional chefs. Uh, sometimes we also add dishes that customer asks us to add, and then the chefs are helping making sure that it's it's done at a certain level. So the level of the recipes are uh, is pretty high. And uh, then you choose the dishes that you want. You, there are different filters and categories. And uh, after you fill up your cart, you go through a booking process where you either choose a chef or the platform assigns a chef for you if you don't really care who the chef is. And s- some people don't mind. And they have more flexibility. And then you also choose if you want the chef to do the grocery shopping for you or you will do it. And uh, if you want to leave a tip or, you know, before okay. the cooking or after. I there are a lot think of I'll options. wait till after I taste the no food. No problem at all. We have <laughs> options. And, you know, chef's accept also cash. It's fine. Oh, that's awesome. And so then, uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. And then, they, um, and then once the order is booked, uh, the chef gets a notification and they, they have an option to approve it or not. Mm-hmm. Most of them approve it, but sometimes things happen they, and they reject an order. So if they approve it, the, sh- the customer gets a shopping list and uh, can mark what they have at home. And then the chef will buy all the rest. And if the chef can't make it, then we find another chef. So we have a network and a, a community of chefs that we they help each other. And if someone doesn't feel well, no problem. We got your back. Don't worry about this. Oh, that's great. So it's a beautiful thing, you know, for chefs helping each other. Some more experienced chefs have help the less experienced chefs, although all of them are experienced, but there are different levels of experience. Okay, so what's the best food? What uh, I know there's healthy stuff, and there's probably some stuff that is... Uh, uh, less healthy. Um, do I w- give me a variety? Um, give me give me kind of like an overview of what I might run into. Yeah, we have so many different categories, and it's funny to say our um, uh, one of the our team members, Delton, when he joined, I'm a health nut, so. All the dishes I uploaded ever on the platform were all healthy, like okay. 100% healthy. And, and then with time, we added also things that are, you know, comfort food, more cheesy mm. and with sugar and, you know, white flour, white rice. And when Delton joined us, uh, he looked at the menu and he's like, where's my food? Uh. <laughs> he's young in his 20s. He wants to eat the fat food, give it like the tasty, delicious. Yeah. So we have like the comfort category and we have desserts and we have d- different options. Like basically everybody can find whatever they want. And okay. So do you like have salmon? Like if I would like, I, yeah. I really like salmon that's been uh, put in an air fryer. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Can I get that? Yeah, of course. And then I give them my air. I put my air fryer yes. on the counter, yeah. and they cook it in my air fryer. They use the equipment that you have at your home. Okay. So we have a lo- lots of dishes with uh, salmon or other types of fish, and fried or baked or seared or anything you know can come to your mind. Not just fish, also chicken, meat, uh, vegan. Eh- a lot of different options. What if I want them to cook it in like Traeger? I want, I'm, I like yeah. the, sta- the taste sure. of the smo- smoker. Smoked. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, they, they can do whatever. They come to your home. They're professional chefs. Okay. Even if it, if it, you ask them to divert a little bit from the recipe, they can totally do that. Oh, interesting. They but, so they come out to the house and you're like, hey, can you put a little extra salt and pepper? I yeah. like it that way. Oh, okay. yeah. We have a lot. So we have a, um, a partnership with a dietitian uh, from LA that uh, she basically we uploaded her cookbook and her customers are booking on Foodum her dishes and have chefs come and cook for them to help them be successful in their diet. So most of her dishes are, you know, they're, they're not, so f- the flavors are, uh, at, at a certain level, but some people want it more flavorful or more spicy mm-hmm. or, you know, different um, options. So I have customers that actually write in the comments, full blown on flavor. Awesome. The chef knows what it means and, and they know how to help the customer. Or there are some people that the husband eats 
between zero to 10, 15 on spicy, but the rest of the family eat normal. Right. We can accommodate that too. Oh, wow. There are different ways to do that. So, okay, give me an idea of the price. Okay, I, uh, let's assume I buy the groceries because the groceries are going to be a variable. Hey, mm -hmm. I want a, a salmon. That may be a lot more than chicken, let's say. Um, yeah. Or sea so, bass or some oh, other okay. fancy, you know. But yeah. you can get whatever. Let's you say I want to do the yeah. shopping. You can go get it. Yeah. And uh, and you, where do you guys buy the stuff? I mean, you got to go to the just grocery the store? regular grocery yeah. stores. Okay. If you want Whole Foods or you want a Rayleigh's or a Nuggets, a oh. whatever people prefer, Sprouts, like all the regular stores. Oh, okay. We do. We do. I do have some um, work that I'm doing with uh, some food companies. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll maybe partner with them and figure out different ways to get uh, ingredients. Uh, like for example, we're uh, one of our advisors from Imperfect Food. Their COO is an advisor, and we're figuring out a way, maybe you know, to collaborate. So you know, different alter uh, different alternatives. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so I get. Uh, but yeah, let's assume that uh, I uh, I provide the, subtract out the cost of the groceries. I go get all that stuff. Yeah. Um, now I just want to have somebody come out and make it for mm -hmm. me because uh, hey, my wife's out of town or I'm yeah. lazy or whatever. Awesome. Or you just, yeah, you just want uh, to, you know, spend more time working out and doing CrossFit instead well, no of doubt. cooking. Yeah. Which is, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, spend time with grandkids. Yeah. There are different, different reasons why, you know, cooking that takes a long time. You can do other things at that time. So the yeah. prices. Uh, the prices on Foodum start at $100 per chef's visit. And we okay. have a sophisticated uh, mechanism to calculate the prices of the dishes uh, based on how much time it will take to, for the chef to spend in the customer's kitchen. But the bottom line is that it starts at $100. For $100 you and 4% service fee, so 104 you can have food for the whole week cooked wow. for you by a chef. Depends on the dishes, of course. And I see that on average, just the people that book on Foodum now, uh, and we, we cooked over 500 total you know, meals. Um, I mean, s chefs visited customers over 500 times. Uh, the average is $150. Um, and for $150, you can get six different dishes in, in one meal. And uh, of course, if, you, if you're less sensitive to price, Sky's the limit. Well, yeah. I'm okay. Fine. So let's say uh, some of my listeners might be less sensitive to price. Mm -hmm. Maybe our investor community out there. Mm -hmm. Like I'll throw a party sometimes and have 20 or 30 of my friends over mm -hmm. and then we'll bring in Taro from Akuni's and he'll, uh, he'll cook and mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's like, it's almost like a, um, a party around the food. Yeah. Can you guys do that kind of thing too? Where we, I mean, Taro's a celebrity <laughs> chef that might be a little bit out there, but just somebody who comes in and makes it an experience. I, so absolutely. Okay. Uh, I, I must say that our strategy, just for our investors here or other people on, on the call on that listening to us, our main market now is the busy people that need help with weekly meal mm -hmm. prep. Of course, we do also a special events and small gatherings, holidays. Our customers normally book us also for gatherings, birthdays, anniversaries. They, they Once you start it, it's hard to you know get off it. Uh, and uh, yeah, absolutely. We have like all kinds of cool dishes like, you know, paella. And the fun thing is that we have the full blown fatty paella with the rice. And we also have a skinny one. You know, with <laughs> cold flour rice nice. that, uh, you know, just to accommodate different types of nutrition uh, needs. But definitely we have the comfort food and the special dishes. Uh, another fun thing, uh, when you have like a party, how many times did you want to have different types of cuisines in, in one event? Oh, Normally yeah. it's a harder a thing, but on Foodem you can have a Russian borscht and you can have a, an Indian dish and then a Mexican and maybe even Spanish one and all in like one experience because the chefs cook all the dishes and uh, we're doing it. It's actually pretty fun. Wow. That's like, have, I mean, that'd be perfect for Christmas, right? Just have yeah. somebody come over and cook yeah. Christmas dinner for we, you. We had a few. Yeah. All the chefs were busy with uh, Christmas dinners. Yeah. Wow. That's exciting. Well, I have to imagine that the, the busy, I'm picturing sort of the busy working person, the busy working mom. Uh, boy, I, I'm, I'm running the kids to Little League and, yes. uh, you know, soccer and I got to come home and, you know, I got all kinds of things I got to do. If somebody could just yeah. make the food for me, that would be such a relief. So, so the, the reason I started for them is because I was in the situation where I was driving my kids to different activities and sports in, their, uh, in Oak Ridge in uh, Eldorado Hills. And I would come home and it's really embarrassing to say I would have to stop like in the fast food lane uh, from time to time, Chipotle or some pyology pi or something, just pick up something because it was so late and last minute and everything closes. And then when I was able to find a chef finally, uh, it just 
the feeling of coming home after a long day, eight o'clock, sometimes even nine with the kids' activities, the basketball training pra- practice, uh, you come home, the kitchen is clean. I love clean. Oh, sparkling clean. You open the refrigerator, it's full of delicious food. Everybody gets what they want. And my family is like a Sudoku family. One is vegetarian, one wants fat food, and I'm with the lean, a high-protein, low-carb food. Try and, and solve this every week. It's a pain. Like my brain was hurting just to, you know, in the past, just figuring out what to eat. Now you walk home, it's all ready. Five minutes, put everything out, hit whatever you want, put it back in the boxes, done. Wow. I had to pinch myself, like, is it really true? The and other kind of fast food, food them, the other kind of fast food. <laughs> That is, I mean, yeah, <laughs> who wants to go through the, you know, the, the less healthy uh, sorts of fast food um, when you can have this, a home-cooked meal and it's that actually is cheaper. also healthy? And it's actually cheaper. You know, it, it's mind-blowing. I, um, I, I, I bought for, for my husband a burger in like, I, I don't remember the chain. I, I don't like to do that, but you know, it's fine for the relationship. So anyway, uh, I was really fascinated. I got my receipt and it was like $16 for a burger and fries wow. and a drink. You know, it's crazy. I haven't, been through fast, I haven't been in fast food it's line not cheap. in psh, it's years. Fast. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. I, 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 was like, I, I did not know that. Fast food somehow. I I'm thought a, it's like a way. dollar or two and like $16. It's like a lot. Wow. I, I, and it was just a normal burger and fries, not even something crazy. So the interesting thing is that on Foodem, if you do add the ingredients on an average, like the normal, you know, people, like, you know, just busy families, uh, average, you know, family, it could get to five to ten dollars per serving, including ingredients. That's the mass market. Mm-hmm. I was aiming when I built this because of my, you know, uh, being a good uh, corporate citizen, I was uh, trained to think mass market and price points and elastic- elasticity models. So when I started looking at this, I was like, okay, there is, there is something interesting here. I can, op- I can reach a certain price point that can open up uh, huge markets. And, uh, and then I tested it and I have a proof now it's working. That's awesome. So you've got this company, you've got it off the ground, you've got customers, it's rolling. It's, it sounds like the type of uh, company that could really scale. It could go national, global, yeah. what, what have you. Yeah, so we have already people signing up from everywhere in the world I have it to, to our wait list. It's really cool. Mm. We have people from Australia, from Europe, from uh, Czech Republic, from Israel. Well, done. I mean, I'm from Israel, so, you know, people that, uh, but, but still, just people see us on Twitter or on LinkedIn, and they just go and sign up for wait list. Uh, but yeah, my goal is to be everywhere in every household and in every travel rental. And thank you, Mark, for closing with the first Airbnb. Oh, it happened. I'm super huh? excited. Nice. Woohoo. Uh, <laughs> I have this a few use air- case. I have a few Airbnb, Airbnbs, uh, <laughs> my listeners, and uh, they're, um, you know, if somebody comes in and checks into an Airbnb, you, you want food, right? So why not have food them? So it worked. Okay, you got yeah. connected up. Yeah, we got connected up, and my thinking down the road, and actually it happened to me as a, as a customer to this platform, uh, when I went on vacation, and I don't know if you, you went on Airbnb, to Airbnb during COVID, but actually my husband brought our Ranchilio espresso machine because he was worried that the coffee shops are going to be closed, and then, uh-uh, you know, the wife needs her, you know, f- good coffee. Yes. So we brought our Equator and Ranchilio, and we were ready, but the chef wasn't there. So we ended up standing in the kitchen and cooking for, like, the breakfast, and, like, we looked at each other. And I was like, oh, man, we need to bring one of our wonderful you know, chefs to join us next time. And I had a few volunteers to join us for our next vacation. But um, I th- and, and I did get also chefs reaching out. A, a chef from Jamaica reached hmm. out and asked to join Foodum. And he's like, do you have people v- traveling to Jamaica? So I, I see it coming, you know, from both sides, from the customers and from the chefs. So it's all about scaling. And we're now focusing on building the machine so we can scale it fast. And the machine is, is working, it's robust, and we're ready to, to grow and gradually, you know, a market per quarter and then accelerate it later on to a few markets per quarter. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, two, it's a two-sided marketplace. You'd have the mm-hmm. chefs and then you have the person who wants to eat, the consumer. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to have too many chefs and no buyers or too many buyers <laughs> and no chefs. Well, yeah. How do you solve that? 
Yeah, that's the million dollar question in marketplace <laughs> is the chicken and egg. <laughs> yes. So, so you, we solve it very carefully. Okay, yeah. So but you go into smaller markets <laughs> and uh, and solve it in a small market and then expand from there, kind of, uh, you know, uh, build from within sort of thing? Yeah, so we definitely, it's a hyper-local market, uh, like type of marketing where we start in certain markets. We have a minimum chefs that we add and minimum customers that we add in each area before we launch. That's our playbook for launching new areas that we're learning. So far, we're, we're still in the learning phase, but we did nail down our playbook for recruiting chefs. We know now how to do it. We reduce the time of recruitment from months to two weeks uh, with very clear steps. And the process is really cool. I, I don't think anyone is doing all the things we're doing because there are some companies out there. But uh, it's really cool how we can test chefs from everywhere uh, around the world yeah. without seeing them. And we know how their food will, will, will taste. You got to trust your chef. For the, right? You don't want to have a chef that you don't trust in your house or uh, touching your food so can you walk yeah. me through a little bit of that um, yeah. I don't know, I'm thinking of like first of all you want Back quality concept. control but you also want like safety and security Absolutely, yeah. you're absolutely right. So for safety and security, we do background check, we do reference checks. All of the chefs also have a general liability insurance, and we do. Uh, they all have a food safety uh, certificate. So that's that's a no-brainer. That's easy. Then on the quality side, we um, they're going through a cooking audition, where mm. an executive chef from our team, uh, that you know, part of the Foodum team. Uh, watches, um, her name is Mayumi, she watches all the videos and she decides who passes and who not. Mm -hmm. And when I heard about this, because I'm not a chef, I was like, how can you know if the food is going to be tasty or not? And then I asked a few executive chefs and Mayumi as well. She told me, yeah, I can tell just from looking at what they're doing, their cooking skills, and then what they're putting in there. They have the muscle, mem the, the muscle memory and the knowledge. Like I can tell you in semiconductors and the elasticity elastic models what will work or not because I, I yeah. did it for so many years. So I'm trained in that. They're trained in food. So that was really interesting uh, um, understanding that actually some of these executive chefs can just look at what you're doing without tasting and tell you if it's good or not. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing and it's working amazing. Now, in addition to this, we have like a, a period of about five, five first orders. The chefs are um, we're helping them more than normal before they're like released, you know, ah, to the platform yes. completely. Like hiring a new employee almost, but they're a subcontractor. They're independent contractors, yeah. yeah. But whatever they need, if they have questions, many times they don't remember how to operate the platform. So we created for them a lot of content, and then we're there to handhold them initially. And as we grow, we have some plans of how to scale it because once we have like. 1,000 chefs versus 10,000 chefs versus a million, it's different processes, mm -hmm. but it's fine. You know, we're, we're looking at it, you know, one step at a time. Wow, exciting stuff. So in terms of uh, recruitment of chefs, big challenge, mm -hmm. but you're overcoming it. Um, what about, it, it would seem to me that the demand, people just need to find out about you. Yes, it, that's and then, true. Because the... the yeah. The everybody needs food, and if it's uh, more affordable, it's more healthy, it's uh, more convenient. It's a no-brainer. Then yeah, it's just like the the people will kind of line up. They just got to get in the habit of using it. Yeah, yeah. Who who doesn't want to have a chef? There are yeah. some people, by the way. They're in every. A, a market or marketing or product, there is a curve. Uh, it's you know crossing the chasm theory. Mm -hmm. So normally with customers and also chefs, you start with the innovators, and they're about like two three percent of the population. Then you move on to the early adopters, yeah. and then you move to the uh, early majority and late majority. And I see it when I speak to a customer. I know and chefs as well. I know who they are, yeah. where they fall. So we have like a pipeline. You know, a year for later on, come back. You know, we can help you now. Well, I think that's how we were for Airbnb or Uber. Uber. Exactly. When you get into Uber, your first yeah. time is like, oh, yeah. I trust the cab because it's yellow or whatever. And somebody shows up at a Celica and you're, uh, I guess I'm going to jump in the first time. Now it's like, why wouldn't I use Uber? Exactly. And when I mean, you start uh, early on, it, it's hard to be perfect. You know, it might not look the best. The experience might be a little bit, but if it's a real painkiller, then our in innovators and early adapters, of course, they forgive us for or, or forgive Airbnb mm -hmm. because it really solved a big pain point. Okay. So my focus is, okay, how do we solve the experience the best we can and then uh, get as many more people as we can to hear about us that are open to try it early on? And actually, we have advisors from Airbnb, and uh, one of them is uh, one of the first uh, employees of Airbnb, a uh, very senior person. And he actually said that our user experience is the, 
actually even better than what Airbnb was early, early on, like in very, okay. very early days, which I find it hard to believe because they, the folks there are designers. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's a, I, I don't know. But a, or maybe I am too harsh with myself of wanting to be better and better all the time. That Foodum will look better and perform better. Uh, and, and I don't know if I can stop doing that. Yeah. But uh, what about personality of the chef and oh, yeah. person and matchmaking with the personality yes. of um, the consumer? Some consumers are you jump in the cab or you jump in the Uber and, and you they want to you. talk your ear off. And then <laughs> others of us, please don't talk to me. I don't want to be bothered. What about those kind of things? Totally the same. <laughs> so one of our thinking on our roadmap, we yeah. have an AI concierge that will do matchmaking oh. uh, between chefs and customers and customers and food. So we uh -huh. will help do this matchmaking on the roadmap later on yeah. after our uh, fundraising. Uh, but for now, what I do see that, um, and it, it works out okay, I would say, but still there are some customers that love their chefs and the same chefs uh, with other customers, it's not such a good match. So I did notice that there is a personality trait here. And normally for meal prep, you know, chefs come, they do their stuff and they go. Normally chefs work in the back of the kitchen. Uh, most of them, they're more of like introverts. Mm, uh, they're not okay. like front. Uh, they're not like the hostess or the waitress uh, that okay. are more friendly. Uh, but still, there are chefs that love to perform and they want the crowd and you see them like uh, doing parties and classes. But then there are the other chefs that, you know, they're very nice and kind, super sweet people, but they're not that talkative. Uh, mm -hmm. They just come, do their stuff, do it very well in a nice, comfortable environment, not like a stressful restaurant. So there is something for everyone. And we do plan to add, currently we're doing it like uh, not formally, but definitely there are events and there are uh, classes and there are different ways to use, you know, food. Them. But in the future, we'll, we'll have separate types of experiences and monetize it differently. But mm -hmm. to start off, we need to focus on one thing to be very good at that. And that's the weekly meal prep. All the rest is is a, a bonus. <laughs> well, most people today are worried about COVID at some level. Some people are paranoid yep. Uh, yep. and they want to stay in their house. They don't go out to restaurants yep. or anything. Other people, um, uh, you know, they're not as worried, but has that, has COVID been a challenge or has it been more wind at the back because, Hey, I don't want to go to a restaurant. I'd rather have somebody come to my house. Um, or are they afraid of people coming into their house, which is a, which is the, b the best or the worst of COVID? Yeah, I think it's a, it depends on which time frame early mm. on when people didn't know. So the, the first response is shut down, everything shut down, don't come come close to me. Okay. And, and then as people eased into it, the processes were more clear. Also restaurants, the entire industry went through such a shock in March of 2020, which is, by the way, when we launched our platform three days before everything shut down. That's interesting. And that was yeah, an interesting time. I, my husband told me, sweetie, you know, maybe, maybe you'll put it on hold, go back to Intel. And yeah. I was like, nope. I'm, I'm well, like a, I'm like a nuclear bomb. Once I'm targeted on something, there is nothing to take me off that. I'm gonna make it happen. Yeah. So interesting. So it was interesting time. So when launching at that time, um, was it harder in some ways? Because uh, I mean, I know besides, hey, we're all worried about COVID. All of, all businesses were affected. Mm -hmm. But in terms of launching something like this, um, it's it. You think it was a bad time to start it? I, I, I don't look at things as good or bad. Okay. Um, it's another dimension that need to deal with, another, like, you know, a complication. So if without COVID, there was certain, uh, you just, what I needed to find out is exactly how it impacts everyone. And to, I, I knew the world before, and then the world changed in front of us as we were going, and the new world is actually badass, awesome. A lot of things are online. A lot of people moved. The in-home in cooking grew dramatically. It used to be one point eight yeah. trillion dollar market. Now it's much more than that. Yeah, and, and, this and is the delivery to our house uh, yeah. has escalated like crazy escalated. in terms of food. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it sh the sh the consumption of food or the creation of food shifted dramatically, and uh, people, you know, feeling uncomfortable going to yeah. grocery stores, they preferred chef to buy for them yeah. to do grocery shopping for them. And more people are wanting to live in Rockland and El Dorado Hills than yeah. they do in the inner Movement city right to next the to where you can yeah. walk to get something to eat now you're yeah. in a suburb you're yeah. not probably not, not so gonna many walk yeah yeah not so many options so the way i look at it it's actually helped a lot for them in uh, many different ways and um, of course you know where my goal is to focus on suburbs less the central cities okay. where we it's like doordash you know strategy early in the early days where you help uh, people that are further away not so many options of, of food we have great you know food options here in our area 
but uh, you know we're available in the Bay Area, in LA, and in in the Greater Sacramento area. And I see that you know when you are a little bit further away, definitely there are less options, and people don't want to go out that much. They prefer to have the food ready at home. Mm-hmm. They're busy. They don't have time. So it it does help. Also for the chefs, the industry changed dramatically. The fact that people are now yes. cons- uh, cooking food more at home. Just one more thing to mention about uh, people cooking at home. Our main market is uh, we're coming to solve our target audience is people that cook at home. We're not there to replace people that buy already pre-made food or do delivery. That's awesome. Keep on doing that. We, uh, my goal is to help busy moms and dads and families that cook themselves and don't have the time to do that. Okay. So it's, it's, an, it's a blue ocean um, and most of, about two thirds of the people that book on Foodum actually are cooking by themselves. So we, and, and I'm, I'm doing it very targeted with the messaging and the solving the, the problem we're solving. So that's my main goal is to help these people. And this is more than two trillion dollar market just in the US worldwide. It's much, much, much bigger. Now, on the chef side, why uh, the chef side ch- or the, you know, uh, the supply side of the market is changed dramatically. If in the past uh, people worked in restaurants, we see now that many chefs do not want to go back to restaurants and there is shortage of employees in, mm-hmm. in restaurants, unfortunately. Uh, these people, some of them completely leave the industry. I met many chefs that completely shifted their work uh, as delivery people, uh, uh, like you know UPS, like uh, trucks delivery, people that work in the car industry uh, and different other professions. So we lose talent that uh, loves to cook food artists I call them food artists we mm-hmm. lose them because they they don't want to deal with the stressful environment that paid the minimum wages so the, what foodum offers them is a, a place where they can express their creativity and have and and gain their freedom food f- foodum is food freedom so mm-hmm. we want to give them the freedom to express their art and to earn distant living with flexibility and And with enough work so they don't have to worry about how they're gonna you know pay the bills so on foodum because we're there are no um, legal limitations or regulations in cooking at your home if a chef comes to your home they can do what you can do whatever you want at your home if, if the chef cooks at their home there is a lot of legislation around that and we know the a b626 here in California that you have to have or if, if that's if you want to cook at your home or if um, a chef cooks out of a certified kitchen that's fine and Uh, but it's it's more complex that's for the delivery but with foodum we bypass all of that and coming and cooking at your home they have no limitations they can make as much as they want when they cook at their home and deliver it's up to 50,000 a year so they have a lot of freedom and normally they make about 50 between 40 and 70 dollars per hour on foodum today mm. in the future we'll open it up and have more a uh, price tiers and Uh, but currently it's a, a little bit early to have a few tiers. What does an Uber driver make per hour? D- eight, 10, 13 minimum wages. Okay. I think now they have to pay at least minimum wages, so probably also around the $13. So they're making a, your, your uh, contractor, they're making a very nice wage when, and they can do it when they want to do it, right? It's still on their own terms, similar to an Uber driver, mm-hmm. um, but... They, they make they a heck of a lot more money and they get to do their art at the same time. Yeah. Make people very, very happy. Yeah, and we save them a lot of time. So if uh, you look at uh, you know, other platforms that uh, offer chefs uh, work in different constellations, Uh, on our platform they, they, they don't need to do anything we provide them the recipes we provide them the order and the details on the customer and all the information everything they need all they need is just to ping the customer hey I'll see you soon read right. five minutes or ten minutes just go over the dishes that they want normally after a few times already know all the dishes by heart just see the, the quantities and if there are any special requests and that's it and then rock and roll they just love it. It's, uh, it's, it's hard for me to understand because I'm not a good, you know, I'm not, cooking is not my uh, area of strength. But when I see them shine in the kitchen, it's meditation for them cooking. And then I get the messages of like, I'm happy. I'm so happy. Thank you. It's just worth it. Somebody has to be there to let them in the house and tell them where the pots and pans are. Awesome question. Yeah. I actually have a customer that is now in Israel with her baby. And she booked a chef because she's coming back tomorrow. She wants to come to a, a full refrigerator. Brilliant lady working in tech. And uh, the chef actually just now finished cooking at her home. Okay. Uh, so she gave them the code to the house. The chef came in, prepared the food, uh, cleaned up, left. And she's coming back. 
and that's it. Food is ready. When they clean up, do they just put the stuff in the dishwasher? Or they wash it in the sink. How does that work? They, they wash it in the sink uh -huh. um, for. Um, and and it's really depending on what customers want. If some mm -hmm. customers want extra, you know, the uh, warm water, uh, you know, sanitizing things, you know, they might ask the chef to put, to put it okay. in the dishwasher. But the ones that are going through my home, we can't tell them what to do because it's, you know, it's their craft. They know yeah. better than me. But the ones that are going through my home, I do say they wash everything by hand. It's amazing. It's really mm. amazing. Okay, so... I see all, well, I can imagine the upside, and but there's the, the challenges. We talked about COVID a little bit, which I'm sure was a, a challenge for everybody. Um, what challenges are you, we ran into the chicken and egg thing. What else is there that's sort of the big milestones that you have to hit in order to uh, take this thing around the world? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a journey. It's a long journey. As, as you know, entrepreneurship is what, like five to 10 year journey. I think five years is like <laughs> a dream, but probably more like 10, 12 years. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we're, we're, you know, we're on the second year. And um, the things that I do see, obviously, uh, there is building the team and mm -hmm. finding the right people to join us and then having the funding to be able to afford the people <laughs> that I really want because they're all badasses mm -hmm. and expensive and great. Yes. And it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality and having a, a small a commando team can get you so far. And uh, I personally believe, you know, we have uh, three values in our company uh, that when I left Intel, I didn't have a badge. I, I would walk in my, you know, the office space and I would be like, beep, beep, as if I have like a badge. But then, you know, I missed the values in the back. So I created oh. values for us. Yes. And the values that I, you know, and, and I, I live through it and I'm the example for that is first of all, we want to cre create magical greatness, things that don't exist today and solve problems in a creative way, but in a way that doesn't exist. You say so magic, you call it magical I greatness. I call it magical. Yeah. Oh, because magical. it's uh, magical and, and it's magical. It didn't happen before. And it's so great. It's level at Intel. They would call it excellence, but I, I, I like the magical greatness. Right, more. it's different than um, excellent. Magical it, greatness it's is it's still like excellent, but it's my, yeah. it's yeah, it's exactly it's the wow factor yeah. there that is more and and that's your number one core it, value. Yeah, it, it that's yeah. what makes me wake up in the morning. This magical greatness, like if, um, I need the stimulus. I need to do things that are you know amazing. Yes. Uh, and then that's what I tell the team that join us, and that's you know we attract the right people to join us because you know we're all like that. And then the second thing is do good to the world. And I think you're, you, you probably connect to that as well because you're doing so much goodness to our community and to people around you. Thank if you. I, I have to do something good, there must be meaning in what I do. Otherwise, I just, it's hard for me to you know, keep on operating. Mm -hmm. So the goodness that we're bringing to the world is to the environment, is reducing food and packaging waste, is creating new jobs, is reducing stress in people's life, and also reducing uh, diseases like uh, uh, you know, diabetes uh, that skyrocketed during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and also obesity. There are a lot of things that we can help reduce that over the years, just by default, just by using, but by uh, buying from food and versus fast food or other options. So that's mm -hmm. number two. Do number good. three? Yes, magical. Do good to the world. Yeah, do magical, good the good world. world. And number three, it's very, very important have fun ah yeah. yeah yeah we must have fun it you can still do magical greatness in very high level of performance but you have to have fun to bring your soul to wake up in the morning to see the spark in the eyes of everyone well what do you do to have fun? okay so how do you how do you bring i, I make <laughs> i'm curious you've got these workers uh that are not in an office i can picture having fun in an office and ringing the bell when there's someone who makes a big sale and you know throwing little get-togethers and celebrations but how do you do that when your workers, uh, a lot of your workers are remote and they're in other people's homes. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a, there are a few aspects for that. Okay. So, first of all, there's the team itself where yeah. we do have fun and we do think the about internal team, the, the internal employees team. of the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the internal company. team. And, uh, you know, the fun of uh, trying different dishes and a lot of different foods. Oh, yeah. And uh, we're many times sharing. So, likely, we're all local. I don't know. Well, you know, probably I attracted the local people here that I would love to build a unicorn here in our area and create a lot of job opportunities here in the area. So all the first, you know, team members are all from here. Nice. And uh, Delton, for example, he enjoys, uh, he basically tries almost all the dishes on the platform because we, we always have like tons of food prepared by chefs. So I, I bring to the office and we, we laugh about this, that in a small startup, you can have lunches. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
<laughs> One of our mottos uh, around here is nobody builds a truly great yeah. company alone. And yes. when you're in a startup uh, like like what you are, you really have the opportunity to mm-hmm. build it your way yes. it with and, and have people people that are attracted to those values, doing something magical, doing something good, good. for the mm-hmm. world, doing s- something fun, like. People are going to be attracted to those values, and I guess that's one of the beauties of a startup is you kind of start from scratch. Yeah, and we yeah. did we do have experiences where you know the the right people. What's amazing is that I sometimes get people like some of our team that said, "I don't care about how much I make. I just want to do that, yeah. and I am taking care of them to make sure they make at least like the market or more, and I want to." pay them above the market so I got you I got your back and and they just love what we're doing for each one of the folks on our team that they they have their core core strengths but if they want to try and and tap into something else of course you know if one is an operations manager but he wants to do something in marketing or the developer wants to do something that's not related to what they're doing everything is fine I learned at Intel and I saw how beautiful it is where people can do uh, different jobs from completely different areas like I had an IT person manager that became a char person that then switched to engineering and it's all the same person and it was amazing so I took uh, you know I'm learning that it's actually we're as humans we can do a lot of things that's what people like so give them the opportunity in startup when we're a small commando team yeah we have to do everything so this is my positive spin on that <laughs> <laughs> yep I can relate uh, so you are um, and I, yeah. maybe I should have disclosed this earlier you are a part of the growth factory yes. one of uh, lucky the people. things I'm most excited about in life is the growth factory startup accelerator with a company venture fund and you are far to, part of our first um, 15 companies mm-hmm. Um Describe what that's like. You, you've been involved in other accelerators, and you're, you're not a, a novice to, to this. Um, what's mm-hmm. it like going through the growth factory? Because we're a startup. You're a startup, uh-huh. um, but you're a startup with uh, a lot of experience. So I, 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 that's amazing. Um, I've, been, I've done a few different accelerators, and what I love about joining um, you know, the growth factory is, first of all, the love. It's genuine love and caring. It's a safe place where you, s- you gathered uh, this uh, super companies, startups. Uh, good job uh, on that. I just see the people around me and I'm, I'm wowed. So thank you for you know, including me in this. It's a, it's a really a- exciting thing. And um, so first of all, in, in there is personal touch. There is a, it's tailored, the program. Although there it's structured, still it goes down and, and you guys are helping us, each company at the stage we are, because companies are in different stages. And you know it's across the spectrum from the very, very early on to people that are already like getting ready for Series A companies, I mean. So, and we're like right there in the middle uh, preparing for seed. So it's super helpful. It's very, it's, it's so hard when there's so many things to do, small team, you know, we, we, we're running between the trees, banging sometimes against, you know, mm-hmm. the, the trunk of a tree. And then, you know, you need to zoom out and see the entire forest and build the story and, and you know, zoom in and out in like in minutes. Because if a customer, you know, calls me and I'm in the middle of the growth factory, the, the lunch, the founder's lunch, and the customer is chatting with me on the chatbot and I need to answer. So I'm like diving deep into the wood, looking at the little mushroom that popping out after the yes. rain <laughs> and then I'm like boom out okay now we're talking yeah, yeah, about big strategy yeah. yeah that's interesting mm-hmm. um I, I hope that uh I hope that anybody listening um well I know if you're listening you're you're gonna have you have more respect for the growth factory now that you've met Renetta because I mean companies um that are in our cohort you um specifically but in addition to you we have great founders. These Amazing people, founders. I see you helping each other. You oh, yeah. helping uh, the person across the, uh, yeah. you know, across the room, and, and, and they help verse. me. Yeah. They, uh, I mean, so that's the one thing I learned about founders, and I'm I'm grateful for the founders in in our cohort. Founders help each other. One of the greatest support uh, support I get is from other founders, and um, and this is something beautiful that you guys created and, and help us found each other. So we uh, we already knew some, but some are new that I didn't know before. And um, I think that's a great community of helping each other and then having your help above that with the structure, really, really helpful. One of the things that also helped me a lot is the Lean Stack approach mm. that uh, you guys helped us with. And it helped me articulate our traction roadmap and then focus on 
you know, I, I want to get to, uh, you know, $10 million uh, run rate per month. But before that, I need, I need to build the steps towards that. And it's different actions and strategies to get to different, to each one of those steps. So it's very helpful to calm us down <laughs> and to tell us, you guys are okay. That's fine. Yeah. Let's do it. You know, baby steps. It's not baby steps. We're all like hungry, crazy, running fast. But just need to run to the right direction. Yes. So you guys are helping us run all this energy we have. You're helping us tailor a, a, a funnel it in a, in a productive thank, way. Thank you. Well, hopefully we were helping you course correct because it's a series of course corrections. Oh, yeah. You're from point A, going from oh, C yeah. to series A. There's a lot of course corrections. Even in that, uh, what might sound like a small step to somebody listening, there's a thousand course corrections in that with the customer journey and so on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so advice as, as we wrap <laughs> up, you know, <laughs> Thinking about the person who is listening in and thinking, boy, I have an idea. I'm thinking of starting something that could be a big change for the world, it could be magical, it could be good, and I want to have fun. What would you say to that person who's maybe at the beginning stage of their journey? Yeah, I actually was asked about this some time ago, and I, I came up with this framework that helped me. I, I call it uh, the, art, uh, the art of the spark. So you have a spark of idea. But what do you do about that? So there, there are three major steps uh, to approach it. What I did with Freedom initially before many you know, months and years before I actually started, I started by asking people around me and checking who else have the same pain point because normally it's a pain point that you have an idea how to solve that you're intimate you have an intimate mm -hmm. knowledge or or experience or something unique that others don't and it's fine each one of us is special and each one of us here on earth have a certain thing to do so don't underestimate you know your idea uh, so what I did, I started asking people around me and identifying, and I noticed that there is a big need for that uh, from, from the customer side. And I had some assumptions about the chef side that, thank God, you know, were true and even much better than I, I thought. Uh, but then uh, I did a lot of research to understand what's the size of the market, what is the regulation in the market, months and months of research. Uh, and, uh, and then I tested it. So uh, ask, research, and test. Art. Art. Ask, research, test. That's yeah. easy to uh, yeah, remember. Yeah, it's the, the art of the itch. Yeah, I got yeah, the yeah. itch when I was at <laughs> Intel. It's like itching and you can't stop. Yes, yes. <laughs> so the testing is uh, putting together a quick test that doesn't cost a lot. I yeah. used like this no code $18 or $15 Weebly uh, website. Mm -hmm. Did some hacking in the back with Excel and some um, a PayPal account. And I just wanted to check if someone will actually order. And after like 100 orders, including people I don't know and people that heard about us in, in a football game where well, they were sitting in near someone and someone told them so I asked how did you hear about us and uh, after a hundred dollars I'm like mm, okay there is something here let's do it so then I, I bootstrapped and invested uh, about seventy five thousand dollars in building the platform and, and get going with that that's awesome well very proud that you are part of the growth factory thank you for coming on the show thank and you. sharing your story I know you inspired other people who are at those beginning stages of like what do I do and I think you know, the things that stood out to me today were definitely have fun. And if you're at that beginning stage, think about art, right? Think about asking around, thinking about doing a little research and then test it out and see what happens. Yeah. This itch, you know, scratch it. Scratch it. Don't let it go away. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Renetta, the founder of Foodum. Thanks for joining Thank me on the you. show. Thanks for watching today's show. My goal for every episode is that you find a takeaway, something tangible you can use in your business today. And if you have a comment about a favorite takeaway, feel free to put it in the, in the box below. And if you have a, a topic that you'd like me to bring up on the show, don't forget to let me know. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about entrepreneurship. Because at Haney Biz, we are always by your side.